Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Central Baptist Church 101 Bible Class, Gainesville, Georgia. Our pastor is Reverend Mike Taylor, and our teachers are Jim DeLay and Walter Smith. I'm Walter Smith. Let's dig into God's Word. The lessons is a, a lesson that is quite common. It's one of Paul's letters. And does anyone know what that letter is? Romans. The book of Romans. And it's a lovely book that Paul wrote. And uh, one phase of it tells us that some people have doubts about Jesus loving them and being saved. And we're all born sinners. But when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in and lives within us and lets us know we're off track. And then we repent. But did you know we don't repent to God personally? We repent through Jesus Christ. God can't look on sin without it being cleansed by the blood of his son and so when you pray a prayer you always remember to say in Jesus' name because Jesus is our go-between between God the Father and Jesus Christ and he loves us he loves each one of us he'll always love us but we have to do something on our own when we sin, we repent in Jesus' name to God the Father. And if we don't do that, the Holy Spirit will nudge us because when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in and lives within us. So we got help in keeping ourselves right with God the Father through Jesus Christ. Do you remember the verse... God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's very important because he gave his son and he was crucified and he shed blood to save us from our sins. Future and also the present and the past. So, uh, Jesus loves us. He's like a brother. He's very good, and we have a responsibility to do as much as we can to not sin. And if you get saved, you don't sin like you did before you got saved. It's sometimes a kind of a ha uh, an accident, or else you forget, as often we do, that you did not do the right thing. Uh, we're not saved by works, but after we're saved, then the works count. So what we have to do is to be a good worker, too, after we get saved. If you're doing a good works before you get saved, then uh, the Holy Spirit will nudge this person if he's right for being saved. So it's very important to know that we shouldn't doubt our salvation. Salvation is free, but in a way it costs because we have to live a better life than we lived before we got saved. Here's a song that helped me. <laughs> Jesus loves me. 
assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation, purchase of God Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long This is my story, this is my song That was tuned up just a little too high for me, but uh, I've learned that I need to check things. As a Christian, we got a lot of things to check, haven't we, to make sure things work out just right. Uh, when I was growing up, at the age of 11, I joined the Boy Scouts, and it was a Christian organization. And did you know that the motto in that organization was do a good turn daily because the founders were Christians and they knew that people needed to know and uh, said a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave and clean and reverent. That's what a Christian ought to be too. But he needs to be saved to get credit for all that for the hereafter. We're in the book of Romans, and, uh, and we're in Romans 8, 28, 30. Because of Christ, nothing will keep us from God and His work in our lives. So Jesus Christ is very important in a Christian's life. Remember when you pray, you have to use Jesus' name. Because God doesn't look on sinners without a blood sacrifice through Jesus Christ. Very important. He says some people are full of anxiety when asked if they're saved. And after they get saved, after years of working at it and not really succeeding at it, some people doubt their salvation. But we need to keep in touch with Jesus and the Father together by prayer. If you're not praying, you're not communicating with the Lord. So we need to pray. And uh, the Lord will answer your prayer in probably three different ways. One way, He might delay in what you're asking for. And another way, He might... Uh, say no to what you're saying and then another way he you trust he'll say yes and that has to do with the way you live as a Christian if you get your prayers answered and uh, we have to have patience so one fellow was told by his pastor said you just need to have patience he said pray to the Lord for it and he said Lord give me patience now <laughs> So a lot of people don't, they need help. But Jesus Christ is standing by to help you in your problems. Sometimes he doesn't uh, need you to pray and ask for certain things. He knows what you want and what you need, and it's within his will. So we have to be within his will. If we're not within his will, then uh, we're, we're not going to get our prayers answered. It might be a delay. It's very important. Daniel was a man the Bible describes as being greatly loved of God, and God would have answered any more. He would have surely answer Daniel's prayer. But there was 21 days Daniel didn't get his prayer answered, and he'd been getting his prayer answered all the time. But did you know there was a satanic hindrance that caused him not to get his prayer answered for 21 days? There was this devil's angel. He was called the Prince of Persia. And uh, the messenger, God's messenger, wasn't allowed to get through. And he prayed. 
and he prayed 21 days and waited and then he prayed and God sent Michael to open the gate so this devil's angel wouldn't stop him so Michael heard the prayer and was given the order and he went to uh, Babylon and Persia and he had a bout with the devil's angel and he won out and uh, it was a message about prophecy about latter day prophecy of the country of Israel and, his an and it was answered prayer was answered after 21 days but sometimes we have to have patience to get our prayers answered it's very important but Daniel had no doubts. He was just wondering a little bit about his salvation. He was sound and secure, no question about it. But it's easy to be insecure, especially if you don't get your prayers answered or you don't have any comfort or something happens to you that you don't think it ought to happen. But... Uh, we know the greatest Christians in the world have suffered the most sometimes. But the Lord can protect us. There's no question about it. If we're honest and true and we're doing the best we can not to sin, we, we can't just get saved and live the life you did before you got saved. Have you ever known people to do that? Well, you wonder if they got saved or not, don't you? So... Uh, it changes your behavior when the Holy Spirit comes in because the Holy Spirit won't, you, won't just let you do what you want to do after you get saved. You've already been saved. But we know that it's important to do the best we can as Christians and to listen to the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit is telling us because it's very important. Did you know you can't get saved unless the Holy Spirit draws you? You can pray, and you can do good works, and that will help. And then the Holy Spirit will draw you, and you will not be comfortable unless you do get saved. Make your life miserable. And if you're a Christian and you're continue like you did, you're going to be a miserable Christian because God, through the Holy Spirit, will punish you. I've heard a lot of people say, I had a disaster because I didn't obey what God wanted me to do. I didn't follow in the ministry like I should have. And my daughter died, so I went into the ministry. Or I was in an accident and I got a hundred stitches in my face because after I got saved, I got carried away with pretty girls. God said, no, through the Holy Spirit. So... Christians have a responsibility to do the best they can and to stay away from sin and to witness. We can't get saved by our works, but when we get saved, Christians are known by their works, and they're good. If you're walking down the street and you turn the corner and you see two men beating up another man and he's uh, gonna, they're going to beat him to death, what should a Christian do? to do something to help this person. If he's robust and healthy, he needs to join in to fight, help this person. Or he needs to call the police or somebody, something to help this person. If you're riding your donkey down the road and you see somebody in the ditch, uh, you don't pass the person in the ditch. You stop like the Good Samaritan did. Did you know the Good Samaritans were not Good Samaritans during that day? But that one was good because he stopped and he rendered help and got his, nursed his wounds and kept him. And uh, that's the way Christians should do, help others. We have that responsibility, others. Uh, we don't become so self-centered. We're concerned with our neighbor. Did you know that we're supposed to love our neighbors, we love ourselves? <laughs> and you're supposed to love God with all your might, with all your, um, your heart and all your spirit. That sounds like a big chore, but if you're a genuine Christian, it's not hard to do.
it says that sometimes people have problems with their mate and they wonder if their mate still loves them and what the situation is or if they're going to marry somebody uh, will they marry him or not or have doubts about him but you pray about it and you get over your doubts and you go ahead and that's the way a Christian should behave reading Romans 8, 28 and 30 28 through 30 because of Christ nothing will keep us from God and his work in our lives we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God who are called according to his purpose for those he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters and those he predestined he also called and those he called he also justified and those he justified he also glorified what is justification justification is that you're saved and uh, for some reason or you slip and you sin and you pray for forgiveness through Jesus Christ and it's as if you never sinned isn't that good he remembers them no more now that's not true with the surrounding people in the law if you broke the law or something like that but it is with Jesus one fellow got caught for beating another fellow up and uh, they put him in jail and while he was in prison the chaplain came in and he got saved and uh, uh, got forgiveness for this sin and he asked the, the sheriff he says I've been justified and I'm not guilty of that according to God and uh, he said it doesn't work down here like it does up there said God forgives you for it but you still got to pay here said uh, that might have an influence on the judge that if you change your ways and the light sentence might be light but some people have taught the judge into letting them be not guilty over some crime that was bad uh, because the evangelist went in there and he got saved and uh, it was obvious that he'd been in there six months and everyone knew him and he said this fellow's a perfect citizen a perfect person so he was justified um, it happens sometimes but don't depend on that just be best to, to be free from sin and not sin and be conscious of what you're doing it says that the firstborn term for Jesus superior position over all creation does not mean firstborn in the sense of chronological order except as the first to rise from the dead we don't have anybody else that's been risen, that's risen from the dead, do we? Just the firstborn rise from the dead. And it says justified, a legal term used for the Christian doctrine that God by his grace declares the believer righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the most important person who ever lived on earth. And we have a responsibility to honor him and love him and obey him and do what he tells us to do. It says, in your life, when has a difficult situation worked out for the good? I lost my driver's license. And uh, it was a terrible ordeal. And I uh, went and got another driver's license. And I guess they told me it was going to be from 130 days to 30, 30 days or more. And guess what? Within six days, I got my driver's license to the mail. It worked out. But I learned that I tie my billfold to my belt now. <laughs> I learned, and it helped me to grow up 
I, I used to do that when I was younger, but all of a sudden I got deeper pockets. I said, I don't have to worry about it. But I noticed the pockets aren't as deep as they used to be. So what is God's plan and purpose that he seeks to accomplish in our lives? As much as we love to quote Romans 8.28, we often fail to read it with the verse 29 in mind. God's purpose is for us to be conformed to the image of his Son. God wants us to use everything we experience to make us more and more like Jesus. Anything that brings us closer to Christ and Christ's likeness is always beneficial. So the goal of every Christian is to become more like Jesus. Study Jesus and be like Him. It's very important. That's the big goal, to be more like Jesus, to be a more mature Christian. Do you have somebody in mind that fits that uh, goal? I have several people in mind, and I'm sure you do too. I know my grandmother... She lived to be 89 years of age, and I knew when she prayed, God was going to answer her prayer, and always did. And my mother was right next to her, very important. Especially when I was in the military, they stayed on their knees all the time. We had a Russian bee bomber to fly over our ship about 200 feet right outside of Da Nang when we were going to offload 1,500 Marines, combat Marines. And uh, scared everybody because the Russians weren't in the war in an active manner, but they were supporting. And uh, Captain, let it be known, if they flew over again, he's going to knock it out if they didn't drop a bomb. And uh, I told my dad about the situation in a letter. And she was always worried about me because people were, every time somebody died, they put it in the paper and it just caused everybody to turn against the Vietnam War, the bad situation. And uh, he wrote back and he says, I tell you one thing, son, please don't tell anything in your letter that'll upset your mother. She said she prays all night, and I don't get any sleep the next day. <laughs> but if something if something worries you, that's the most comfort you can have is to pray. Very much prayer is very much a necessity, a tool as a Christian. Have you ever heard of anybody being a Christian and not praying? We ought to pray a couple of times a day at least, and be in a prayerful mood, and to help others. If somebody else has a problem, you pray for them because you're supposed to love them as much as you love yourself. That's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Uh, one fellow told me, he says, what if you got a neighbor and you don't like him and he's always crossing you? I said, pray about it and get you somebody else to pray with you. Two in my name have more weight than one. And uh, he prayed and prayed, and a couple of years later he was on good friends with uh, the neighbor. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. John Adams was the second president of the United States, second vice president. Thomas Jefferson was the third president. And they hated one another. It was a bad situation. They were always at odds with one another. It's just a problem situation. And as the years went by, and uh, they got older, they became fond of one another. They liked each other. They were close friends. And did you know both of them died on the same day, July the 4th? That's amazing. Thomas Jefferson was 83, and John Adams, I think he was right at 90. He was, he was older. But Thomas Jefferson knew about Jesus, and he was a good diplomat. He helped the Americans in the Revolutionary War as a diplomat. He and Benjamin Franklin went to France, and they were able to convince France to come in as an ally. And if we hadn't had France as an ally with their Navy, we wouldn't have got our independence from Great Britain. So 
Both of them were great Americans, but uh, they hated each other to start with. It's bad to hate somebody, isn't it? And not trust them. And you say, the Bible says, love your enemies. Can anybody do that? If you pray for them enough, they might not be your enemy. You might wise up. Very important. It says a purpose for us. So what is God's plan and purpose that He seeks to accomplish? His accomplishment is to grow more like Jesus Christ. Study His habits and follow His example. The more you do that, the more mature you are, the more benefits you'll get as a Christian. And the more rewards you'll get in heaven. It's very important. His plan for us to be like His Son was known in eternity past and in the future when we are glorified we will be mature, complete, and totally conformed to the image of Jesus. We know that when He appears we will be like Him because we will see Him as He is. In heaven we're going to get a glorified body too. Isn't that a wonderful? We won't look like Him but uh, we will have a glorified body and it will be a superior body to what we've got. Let's read uh, Romans eight thirty one thirty four. 34 When then are we to say about what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all. How will He not also with Him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. So remember... Jesus intercedes for us. Interceding is like a lawyer, isn't it? And he's the best lawyer that you can have. They say uh, some of the the most prolific joke or the most jokes are about lawyers, but they're not good for some reason or another. But this Jesus Christ is perfect. He never without an answer. He's always got an answer for everything. And He's always willing to help you because you're His sister and you're His brother. Since God is working for our good, why do we still struggle when life is hard? What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? It says that God's elect people chosen by God to follow Him and accomplish His will in the world. Originally applied to the nation of Israel, but here used to describe Christ's redeemed people, the church. So the redeemed people are supposed to be the church people, and we have a responsibility to act like church people. To an infinite greater degree, Jesus stands in our defense Paul showed us that ironclad defense by asking a series of questions that bring us to our only conclusion as God's children. We are secure, very secure in God. If God is for us, who is against us? No one is greater than God, and since God is on our side, we have no worries. Paul presented his case by arguing that the greater the, the to the lesser God is so much in our corner that he gave his greatest treasure his own son Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for our sins God not only gave his son to die in our place on the cross but God continues to give us everything we need to make it through life victoriously God gave us his best so we should experience the best so we have a responsibility in that regard who can bring an accusation against God's elect? The people of this world can try to make an accusation against us because we do not follow their ways. But nothing they say has merit with God. 
Satan can try to discredit us, but all this, these accusations are unfounded. Why? Because God is the one who justifies. Jesus took all our sin, the basis for any accusation against us, upon himself on the cross. When we repent and ask God to forgive us of all our sins, past, present, and future, are given and removed. The, he erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us, and he has taken it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. Who is the one who condemns? The only one who has the right to condemn is Jesus Christ. Yet, he did just the opposite. And it says, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always lived to intercede for them. And then it said, which truths in this passage give you the greatest sense of security? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can afflictions or distress, or persecutions, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, because of you we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height and depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What does that tell you? That kind of tells you a Baptist, doesn't it? Once saved, always saved, if you're genuinely saved. Once saved, always saved, and it can give us assurance, and we won't be doubting, and we won't worry about our security. Um, there's three things that uh, we need. It says, when will you do with the truth that you are secure in Christ? There's three things it says. It says memorize, and it says memorize the scriptures. Get your security in Christ ingrained in your mind, and memorize Romans 8, 37, 39. It says encourage, write encouraging letters to others when they're struggling for something. Always ask someone, said, can I pray for you? I remember one time I was standing watch in a community, a security officer, and I didn't feel good that day. And a fellow came up to me and he says, "You don't look the same as you did. Are you worried? Do you have problems?" I said, "Yes." He said, "Well, may I pray for you?" I said, "Yes." <laughs> and he gave a short prayer for me. And uh, the next day he was telling me how I felt. I said, "I feel better." So don't be. Uh, so difficult to have someone pray for you or to pray for somebody else. It's very important for Christians. When we need to encourage others, when someone else is struggling, it's very important. Anything you do as a Christian, you will not be rewarded. You will be rewarded in heaven. If someone thirsty and you give them a glass of water, that will be remembered. Anything you do that can help another person. There's an angel. He's writing down ne negative things. He's writing down positive things. Let the positive be the most noticeable. And it says also to minister. You may be sensing God calling you to serve in some way. If you have a responsibility to serve in the church, if it's all possible, serve that position. Take that position and take it or you wouldn't be asked. And it says, uh, don't worry about fear of failure that makes you hesitant. It says, rest on your foundation in Christ and step out in a trustful obedience 
trust him to work in you and through you for your own good. So memorize the scripture, encourage others, and also if someone asks you to do something as a, having a position and you're not so sure about it because you never had that experience, try it. It's important. Anybody have any questions about anything or anything to add to the lesson? Jim, you got a song for us? Well, I guess so. You want another one? Yeah. A long time ago in Bethlehem, so the Holy Bible say, Mary's boy child, Jesus Christ, was born on Christmas Day. Hark now, hear the angels sing, listen to what they say, that man will live forevermore because of Christmas Day. Shepherds in the fields at night saw a bright new shining star. They heard the choir of angels sing, the music came from afar. Hark now, hear the angels sing, listen to what they say. And man will live forevermore because of Christmas Day. Now Joseph and his wife Mary were in Bethlehem that night. They found no place to bear her child, not a single room was in sight. By and by they found a little nook in a stable all forlorn. And in that stable, dark and cold, Mary's little boy child was born. Trumpets sound, angels sing, new kings born today. And we will live forevermore because of Christmas Day. Man will live forevermore because of Christmas Day.